and then live. Welcome to the uh, second series of the MIT Beyond Food webinar. My name is Andrew Nui, your host for today. Um, coming to you live at the MIT, uh, at, from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, today we will be exploring the diversity of the Beyond Food innovation and life cycle journey. We will also be taking questions. Please click on the YouTube link from the MIT uh, Bootcamp events page. Uh, if you're viewing live from YouTube, um, there will be a chat screen on the side. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, today I'd like to introduce you to Franco Borello in the large screen over here from CEO and founder of Coro Energia. He is uh, leading the business development right now in Argentina, uh, South America, um, in clean energy. Uh, Rodrigo uh, Macias from Mexico. He is working on his startup called Personita, which is a uh, next generation uh, healthcare startup. And of course, uh, last but not least, Benjamin Kenning from Toronto uh, in Growing North. How are you today? Doing great. All right, so Franco, why don't we start with you? Can you give us a little bit more of a background on what you're doing? Yeah, great. I'm happy to be here, guys. Um, I'm Franco Borrello from Argentina, boot camper class three. And um, I'm back in Argentina for two years in Boston and co-founded a company to try to close the gap between uh, waste and energy, right? So we're basically using cutting-edge technology from other countries and brought it here to Argentina, which is a developing country, to try to change the way we treat waste um, and generate uh, added value-added products like energy. Awesome. Um, we'll move on to Rodrigo. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much, Andrew, for the invitation, and thank you, all of the participants. And I'm so honored to be here with all of you. And absolutely, thank you so much to all of the people who are watching this right now. And my name is Rodrigo Macias. I'm a medical doctor from Mexico, and I am in a project called Personica, which aims to provide personalized treatments for patients with chronic diseases. So I hope this uh, webinar can provide you some meaningful uh, insights for you, to all of you who are trying to apply for this new bootcamp. So thank you so much. All right, and then moving on to Ben. Morning, everybody. Uh, thank you again so much for having me. Thrilled to do this. Love always working with MIT and leading startup. Um, so, my name is Benjamin Canning, uh, co-founder and current president of Growing North. And what Growing North does is we set up uh, greenhouse food production facilities that work in Canada's far north. Uh, and I don't mean north as in, you know, Thunder Bay. I'm talking Arctic Circle. Uh, so we work in one of the harshest climates on the world, and we're able to produce thousands of pounds of fresh food on a yearly basis to destroy the supply chain positively. And that's what I do. Very, very exciting. Um, all right, so we'll head back to Franco. Franco, tell us, um, why are you so interested in the uh, addressing the challenge of uh, generating clean energy in Argentina? Why is this important to you? Can you share a little bit about your background? Um, and some of the interesting facts uh, that you've shared previously <laughs> about uh, bio waste and, and generating clean energy. Sure. So, as you all may know, Argentina is one of the top food producers in the world. We, uh, we produce uh, from cereals to agriculture to food uh, itself, uh, wine, sugar, olives, etc. So, the agro industry here is basically what sustains the country GDP and that's a very important industry here in Argentina. So, uh, and then on the other side we have right now available technology from other countries that uh, can change the way we treat the waste from, uh, from what we are producing, right? And so right now um, there is a very important topic in Argentina. So the National Congress has declared uh, 2017 as the year of renewable energy, uh, particularly. So we're very excited about uh, working here and 
um, because of this, a lot of producers, of food producers and agro, um, um, you know, facilities are a little bit concerned about their, their waste uh, management practices, right? So they are seeing on one side a risk that can be mitigated uh, by better treating their waste and on the other side a good business opportunity, which is generating renewable energy. Uh, the Ministry of Energy in Argentina has um, has said that they will buy 10 gigawatts of installed capacity for renewables in the next 10 years. So it's a huge business opportunity right now. Um, so we're offering uh, these technologies, um, basically an American Canadian technology that uh, aims um, agro producers and food producers to treat their um, their waste and generate a biogas and through that biogas we can uh, generate uh, renewable energy so right now we're aiming um, um, in industrial and agro waste which is basically um, easier to treat and e uh, it's a waste stream that you can easily predict because they're industry so they uh, they produce a certain amount of uh, waste and that waste is has a very good characterization, let's say. So uh, we're aiming for uh, buying, um, we're, we're having two projects right now, one from uh, a, pig, uh, a pig farm and uh, some other bioproducts bio from, from, uh, from the food industry, um, uh, dairy, 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 uh, dairy facilities and bio, biodiesel facilities. So we're uh, building two projects right now, and we're going to we, we're going to submit that to an auction, who will be here in Argentina around October. We aim to do to finally build our first two projects and take them from there. Uh, so uh, we're very excited about the the, the 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 moment here in Argentina we're having. Uh, it's it's pretty everyone's pretty excited excited here about these uh, new technologies, and I'm I'm really happy to work here in in a in a in a, in a um, in a country that needs technology and needs, uh, you know, to add more value to the agriculture and, and food industry, so. Excellent. So this is just Argentina. Can you also talk a little bit about why is clean energy also important to the rest of the world? Why should anyone uh, listening in be concerned? Yeah. Um, besides Argentina, I mean, this technology can be expanded, expanded through let's say virtually all the world. Uh, we're, we're, we're in, in the middle of a, world, a global discussion about the Paris Agreement right now. Uh, half of the, let's say 25% of global emissions uh, or carbon emissions are come from agriculture and food uh, or other land uses, let's say food, food producing. And the, another quarter, 25% from energy and heat uh, production. So. We are working to close that gap because we are producing less carbon by producing uh, producing energy from food waste, and on the other side, we're uh, we're not burning coal and and, and oil and other uh, hydrocarbons that we right now produce to um, to generate electricity and heat. So we're it, it, this is a global discussion and it has global importance. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 this is a, this has a global, you know, it, it's a global scale problem and we're trying to solve it here in Argentina, but it can be easily expanded to the rest of the world. Absolutely. So in addition to the bio waste that you are um, diverting from landfills, in addition to the health risks, in addition to the sanitation and waste management concerns, um, you know, I guess this is really a larger issue for the entire food industry, for the entire food space, um, agriculture, agribusiness. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about more of the healthcare concerns and the state of uh, healthcare and wellness, perhaps. Uh, uh, Rodrigo, how do you see this to be, you know, all connected in this huge ecosystem on the Beyond Food uh, Innovation journey? Yeah, absolutely. Well. Uh, my objective here uh, in, in this webinar is to let you know that this is not about only foods or only health and wellness. It's about seeing the big picture of all of it. 
and to see about how these elements interact with each other. Because take, for example, that food and diet are basically the foundations of human health. And we need to be responsible and be aware of what we are eating because the leading causes of death worldwide are caused because bad diet and they can be totally preventable with slight changes in, in lifestyle. So, which include, of course, uh, eating properly, doing exercise, uh, and of course, in developing and developed countries, recommendations for having these slight changes in lifestyle has been widely uh, disseminated over the years. But these recommendations are intended for the overall population. And at least here in my country, when you go see a doctor, they tell you, okay, you need to eat well, you need to do exercise. But those recommendations don't make any sense to me because they are not telling you exactly what to do about it. They are just telling you the overall recommendations for the overall population. But what we intend to do here in this project is to provide a specific recommendations for each patient, for example. Uh, which kind of exercise, which uh, at what intensity, at what hour of the day, uh, in diet, for example, which kind of food you need to eat, uh, because when physicians or healthcare providers describe that you need to eat well, they don't consider how these foods are processed, how these foods are transported. And toxins, radiation, there are several contaminants in food that can be harmful for patients. And there are several papers out there that describe that slight changes in behavior and diet can can provide huge improves in, in health and prevent diseases. Take, for example, a paper published several years ago that described how taking a medicine to prevent diabetes uh, in comparison for making lifestyle changes and this article was published to demonstrate that uh, how each and other perform to prevent this disease. And the drug slowed down the process of getting type 2 diabetes by no, only three years. But the lifestyle modifications slowed down the process by 11 years. So that the, this, the, this is telling us that it's not only about getting a drug, it's not only about uh, getting recommendations, but actually getting a specific personalized recommendations for each patient to get the, the best outcome. And I am totally uh, understand how this can fit into this big picture of Beyond Food, because when you're trying to develop a new technology in the food industry or in food uh, to produce food in new ways, you also have to consider how this will impact human health. So... This is uh, the experience that I have so far, and with this project, we are, with this project, we are going to provide personalized uh, assessment not only for health but also to lifestyle behavior, and eventually to prevent these kind of diseases that are the uh, leading causes of death. And in developed countries, for example, in the United States, the third leading cause of death is our medical errors, and. Medical errors probably are not only because of bad decisions, but actually how physicians are trained. And they are trained to follow a, a specific workflow uh, of decisions, but they do not consider every single variant of, the, of that workflow. And by seeing this big picture and by analyzing each step of the workflow and understanding how the patient behave, how the patient eat, how the patient interact with each other. We can provide personalized treatments that eventually will also prevent human error in managing diseases. That is a very um, fascinating perspective, Rodrigo. Thank you. Um, so with regards to that, so what, if I understand what you're saying correctly then, is you're, you're kind of stepping back just from the uh, medical uh, sort of view for a second to perhaps get a holistic view of what uh, constitutes or defines health, right? What is the best outcome for the individual, for the person? And then you're then zooming back in and 
helping that helping that individual um, specifically identify pathways, not just one way, but multiple pathways modalities to then be able to get back onto a better health uh, and quality of life. And really, if you look at the entire scope of why we eat what we eat, why we grow what we grow, why we do what we do in tr throughout our entire life journey, um, it is really about quality of life. It is really about access. It is really about all the, it, a lot of it intangible uh, subtleties and nuances specific to uh, uh, quality of life. Um, and so let's, let's move on to Ben here. Um, ben, how are you improving the quality of life with what you're doing? Yeah, so Growing North's main mission is to reduce the cost of food um, in Nunavut, uh, which is a territory within Canada. Um, and Nunavut as a territory is the most food insecure uh, territory. So I'm just going to um, stop you there for a second. Um, not yeah. everybody knows where Nunavut is. For sure. Um, so <clears throat> with Franco, he is currently in Argentina and South America. And, you know, we alluded to this earlier, but I want to explicitly be very clear. So... Franco's in South America, uh, Mex um, Rodrigo's in Mexico, and Ben, yeah. uh, you're, you're kind of north of us in the U.S., but in Toronto, and where exactly is it Nunavut? Yeah, so um, I'm in Toronto right now, but we work in Nunavut, and Nunavut is on the top of the world, so it it's, uh, borders the... Uh, the Hudson's Bay, if anybody knows where that is, um, and then it goes all the way north to the top of the world and actually basically touches the North Pole. Um, and we work right on the Arctic Circle. So this is uh, well above the tree line where winter goes down to minus 60 degrees and is completely dark. There's no sun. Uh, and summertime can get as warm as 15 to, 25, to 20 degrees. Um, in the peak of summer, and there are 24 hours of sunlight. So it is a very extreme climate where we work. Um, and as a very extreme climate, there is, there's almost no, actually, in the, only in the last few years has there been um, technology available to, to have a, a large effect on local food production. Typically speaking, uh, there there hasn't been a lot of food production in the areas. There's been a small attempt here and there, but nothing to really go year round. Um, and with climate change taking place, and with with the the sea ice not lasting as long, and with the the seasons changing more sporadically, what's happening is the local population, who's typically relied on uh, country food or caribou or seal or whale or, or these types of, of animals, they become less and less predictable and less and less abundant due to climate change. And what's happened is, it, is it's thrown the indigenous population into a state of, of food insecurity or severe food insecurity. And what that means, food insecurity, uh, it's the state of being without reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. Now, every word in that sentence is very important. You have zero access. It has to physically be there. You have, uh, it is not affordable. So even though it's there, it has to be appropriately priced to what the local earn, what the local uh, currency is. Can you is give an example that. about the um, price? Um, I, I remember two years ago you were on TV. And, um, yeah. I don't remember what program that was, but uh, maybe breakfast television or something. Yeah, um, it was breakfast and, and it was the illustration of, you know, bananas... A bunch of bananas, um, one pint of blackberries, and was it milk or some other thing? And how much did that cost? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, like the food basket on average, um, it's about three to four times more expensive than the South. And what that looks like is, for example, we were just up there um, three or four days ago, and a bag of apples, eight apples, was fourteen ninety nine. Wow. Um, and that's in Canadian dollars. I mean, you guys have got us a little bit better in America, but <laughs> uh, in Canadian dollars, that's that's outrageous. That is for. And what would apple the, the apples cost, right? Typically, five bucks, four bucks. Oh my God! Yeah, you can get them for two ninety nine in the set, three ninety nine. Oh wow! Yeah, you can see a head of lettuce sometimes go for twenty eight dollars in the in the dead of the winter. That's crazy. and it's just this mind bending place where subsidies exist to, to try to reduce it, but the cost of freight is too expensive and the businesses that need to sell it still need to earn a profit. And at the end of the day, the people are caught in the crossfire and they don't, 
they don't have a the money to be able to afford this type of produce, uh, this type of, of healthy food alternative. And it's not just fresh foods like apples. It's it's things like milk. It's things uh, like dairy. Um, boxes cereal sometimes will cost nine to thirteen dollars, um, and that's it's just these astronomical prices. So. We set out three years ago with Growing North to, to make a difference in that and to reduce the the overall food basket, the price of food, um, starting primarily with fresh produce. Uh, and it's been, uh, so we currently have one facility operating right now in the Arctic Circle in Nunavut. Uh, it's able to grow six months of the year. Um, and we're getting actually, uh, Rodrigo, it's kind of funny that we were, uh, you're talking about green energy. We're getting uh, our own sustainable or sorry, uh, Franco, rather, uh, we're getting our own green tech system up and running up there to be able to put us off the grid so we don't have to rely on uh, on green tech anymore. Um, but yeah, so we're at the point right now where we've, we've proven the technology works and we're ready to uh, start expanding into the winter season, which will be really exciting. We might be the first people to be able to do that. Uh, we're expanding across the north into multiple different communities which is, again, extremely exciting, being able to, to have a broad sweeping effect across the territory. Um, and we're also discussing getting into, um, you know, a number of different types of food production. So right now we focus very heavily on, on plants, um, on, on edible plants, root vegetables, hydroponically grown, uh, other vegetables. But being able to diversify into potentially doing uh, a a smaller ecosystem, so growing seafood and being able to grow chickens and eggs, and being able to to really start to to address all the the spectrum of of food and not just one particular. That that is very exciting because the uh, you know while you can grow crops, perhaps like root vegetables, potatoes, uh, but by the way, what exactly are you growing up there right now? Yeah, so uh, last year we grew a wide variety of leafy greens. We grew uh, lettuce, kale, Swiss chard. Uh, we grew fruiting vegetables like tomatoes and peas and beans. Uh, we grew some root vegetables like carrots and potatoes and onions and radishes. And this year, um, what we learned from last year is that people loved, um, actually, kale. They loved kale. And we did a really interesting thing there. It, way up north, potato chips are very, very, very popular, and they're kind of the cheapest thing in the grocery store. So, and kids eat them like crazy. And obesity rates are, are through the roof. It's it's very scary. But what we did is we were able to grow kale, and we made kale chips instead of potato chips, uh, and we were able to have a much healthier option that the kids went crazy for. I get messages all the time. Is the kale ready yet? Is the kale ready yet? People wanting to come into the, into the facility exciting. and get some. And then moving back to the ecosystem piece, uh, you know, um, in any uh, growing environment, really, it's not just about the one thing that you're growing because it's uh, very limited. Um, talk a little bit more about the ecosystem that you hope to achieve up there so that suddenly there is, uh, you know, the... Uh, availability, the, the abundant availability, availability of the, and the diversity that really, that's what we're looking at here. Um, how can we make uh, food sources, uh, ingredients, uh, plants, uh, meat, whatever that might be, um, mm -hmm. available suddenly to the population mm -hmm. um, that are in these areas who traditionally have their, uh, what would you call, the uh, traditional food sources uh, that are shrinking in vast uh, numbers. Uh, how, how do you address mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so getting to the first of the question, it was about the range and the ecosystem of food that we would like to actually begin producing. <clears throat> this is, uh, in, in my opinion, growing north in a couple of years, at least. It's not us, it's not us tomorrow. But what we're trying to do is, is, it, is have a real product that is able to add to the to the health of the individuals and be able to reduce food insecurity. So, what a lot of what a lot of people are doing right now in uh, or trying to do in the north right now is is grow hydroponically grown uh, vegetables, which is which is great, and I applaud everyone for for the the effort. The issue with with only producing hydroponically hydroponically grown vegetables is that they're not nutrient dense. Um, they are a fantastic supplement. 
but they're not the whole picture. Um, and yes, we grow them as well. We grow a ton of different types of leafy greens and leafy vegetables. What we need to start looking at is of the entire diet that people are consuming, how much of that is leafy greens? Um, and how much should it be? And where else can we start to get into nutrient-dense vegetables? Things like uh, potatoes and yams or sweet potatoes, onions, uh, these really uh, high-density, high-energy um, types of, of produce that, that are able to sustain people for very long periods of time. And further than that, how can we start to grow within a confined space protein options, uh, hearty protein options, things like uh, we could discuss doing aquaponics and getting uh, fish from it. We could discuss doing uh, aquaculture and vertically growing clams and mussels uh, and being able to get it that way. We can talk about doing a, a small chicken farm on the inside, uh, being able to do eggs and meat from the chickens, uh, even into the space of growing crickets. Um, crickets which can be developed into flour and are a great protein source or can be used to sustain the lives of the fish or the chickens within the system itself. So a very circular idea of being able to produce with what we have yeah. and being able to produce enough to have real big change within the communities that we work. That That is absolutely stunning. I think the uh, big part to growing north too is, um, you know, providing the right environment. And, you know, let's, let's switch back to... Um, Franco, for a second here. Franco, you know, um, the biodigesters that you're working on, um, they provide clean energy as a uh, byproduct. But let's talk about the other byproducts that could be potentially um, useful to Ben um, and all the other locations around the world. You know, you have obviously <coughs> heat, right, which in the north, Ben, is uh, a big issue, uh, heating. We have mm -hmm. um, then talk about the issue of fertilizer. Can you share a little bit about more about what are the other byproducts of this whole biomass uh, clean energy work that you're doing? Um, oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> uh, um, so. Usually when we talk about clean energy, we talk about uh, tackling some challenges in the energy sector, like energy security, like people that don't have access to energy, energy affordability, let's say let's make the energy cheaper, energy availability for larger in industrial settings that needs intensive energy, right? But there are other uh, side benefits which are not so uh, little. Uh, one of them is... Uh, in the um, in the anaerobic digester, we um, you create it's a it's basically a chemical reactor in which you treat the waste, and there are two products out of it. Right, the first one is a, a, a gas which is called biogas, which is uh, basically methane. It's a mix between methane and CO two uh, that you can use for generating energy. Right, and the other side is you generate uh, an organic fertilizer which is the same organic matter that came, but it's, it has better uh, characteristic to use them as, uh, as a direct fertilizer for crops, right? So when the, when the agro producer uh, is uh, taking into consideration to do an investment uh, on these technologies, um, right now we are not taking into uh, consideration the, the, the huge value that this fertilizer can have, right? Uh, we, in Argentina right now, and, and I, th I think this is a Latin American uh, uh, condition, we are able to, to, to have uh, a, a, a fertilizers, like chemical fertilizers, at, as a good, at a good price, right? But some regulations and some studies, they are right now showing the, all the, the, you know, the, the characteristics that... Um, the, the um, fertilizing crops with chemical uh, fertilizers is uh, is changing is changing the, the the characteristic of the product itself. So more and more uh, producers are trying to generate their own organic fertilizers for for avoid the the use of uh, chemical fertilizers. So that's a 
that's a great upside for our project. We're not taking it into consideration right now because of regulation. In Argentina, you cannot sell this organic fertilizer because there's not yet a regulation to, to establish, you know, the, to characterize it and, and to sell it as a, as a product. But uh, producers can at least use that fertilizer on their own crops. So that would be a cost saving uh, to take into consideration in the, in the economic equation, right? Um, so it, this innovation, this clean energy innovation um, can bring, um, you know, upside from the energy perspective, but also for other perspectives to, tack to tackle challenges that uh, current uh, food producers are having right now. Let's say environmental footprint, uh, let's say soil, uh, uh, you know, the soil, is, it, it will have different um, characteristics if you use organic fertilizer instead of chemical fertilizer. Also, water, you don't need water and you, you use less water um, to, to actually um, treat the waste you're, you're, you're generating, right? So you use less water and air as well. Uh, I, 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 besides generating less CO2 because of you're not burning coal to generate your own electricity, you're avoiding um, particular, ma particular organic materials in the air. That brings, uh, you know, uh, insects, insect infestations to the crops. And that's, that are also other uh, benefits from this technology. That's very exciting. So Ben, you know, we begin to see that the opportunity here, perhaps for growing north, could be huge. Primarily mm -hmm. because um, you know a lot of the challenges that are, are faced in the Arctic are, you know, what do you do with waste when everything is frozen? Um, can <laughs> that waste then be um, put back into the ecosystem that you're building? Um, you know, last week, uh, no, not last week, the last webinar, uh, Nidhi talked about, uh, she, uh, she spoke about her work in India where she's basically taking um, um, waste from, from the toilets uh, and the washrooms and then uh, putting that back into the ground where they grow crops. And mm -hmm. so that also could be part of, you know, perhaps something that growing off is could be looking into in terms of where do you get you know uh, your nutrients for your plants for your for your uh, whatever else that you're growing out there and maybe you know if you have chickens things like that where do you yeah. you know <laughs> where do you get your straw <laughs> as an example you know like what are the environment conditions that you, you want to be growing in that that's going to be interesting so um, maybe let's go on to um, Rodrigo Rodrigo talk a little bit about you know the the, I know you talked about the personalization of health, but let's talk also about, um, you know, um, how health in general um, across from South America to North America and perhaps the rest of the world, what, is, what are the key concerns um, that you see from, from a medical perspective that um, a lot of the uh, medical industry or healthcare industry or wellness or nutrition industry is not addressing at this point? Yeah, well, one of the major challenges in healthcare right now is actually trying to develop new ways and new strategies to assess, diagnose, treat, and for the chronic diseases like heart diseases, type 2 diabetes, and so on. These are the major challenges because, as I told you, they represent the leading causes of death worldwide. So physicians, researchers are right now trying to develop new strategies to provide patients meaningful insights to allow them to own the process of their own health and also to empower them to make better decisions. Because one of the major problems, there are several problems in healthcare, but one of them is, for example, the fragmentation of information that you go see a doctor and the doctor makes you to do some lab test and then you go see another doctor and the other doctor don't know anything about those lab tests that the previous one make you. So this is a problem that also have to do with uh, the food and diet because when you are eating, probably most of your healthcare providers don't know anything about how are you eating. And as I told you, because of the way Physicians are trained. They are not. 
so into this process about what exactly are you eating and where this is come from. They are just telling you about, hey, you need to eat these kind of foods. But by analyzing a little bit more about what you are eating, then can provide you a better better recommendations. And this this is not only happening in developing countries. For example, in developing countries like mine, there's a more noticeable lack of these strategies because the healthcare infrastructure that we have right now is uh, a little bit uh, less powerful than in other countries. And we, for example, we don't even have electronic medical record. So there's a lot of deficiencies in, in applying technology in developing countries because most of the time physicians are not to convince of using technology to take care of their patients. And I've, I've seen that in developed countries, there, the digital health trend is, is, is very hot right now and they are applying a lot of technologies in uh, taking care of their patients. Take for example, the wearable technology and uh, health tracking devices that can allow you to understand how are you moving through the day. And this is a very interesting topic to, to watch because eventually these kind of technologies that are already in developed countries can be applied later on in developing ones because technology is getting cheaper and cheaper every time. And if you are looking for these trends that are uh, making a huge impact in developed countries, Later on, these trends can be applied in developing ones as well. Clearly, very huge issues that we're tackling from the developing world all the way to the uh, developed countries. However, let's talk, because we're at MIT, let's talk a little bit about perhaps the life hacks, um, maybe two or three life hacks that um, uh, the uh, person that was listening in right now can begin to start implementing um, um, you know, from your perspective, very, very quickly. Yeah. yeah, for example, very, very important trends that are right now is applying uh, use, the use of the genomic data science to provide, uh, to create new ventures because technology is getting cheaper. So this kind of analysis of DNA is, are also become cheaper. And by analyzing the DNA uh, in this way, you can even create better fruits because you will understand how you will manage the your crops because of DNA analysis and also to provide better diagnosis to patients. So uh, DNA analysis is a huge trend right now and also the healthcare monitoring like uh, wearable devices are, are very interesting ideas that people can look uh, into these trends to start working on solutions, but they should also consider if they are trying to go to uh, entirely to the food side of this food camp, they need to consider as well the implications and probably analyze toxins that are in the foods, probably analyze if there's any radiation in the foods that they are producing. Okay. So. So yeah. really, what I what I, if I if I can just understand what you're saying here, really it's about um, caring more about what you eat, where it comes from, and understanding really uh, deeply is this something that I want to be uh, uh, providing to myself and my family. Um, so thank you, Rodrigo, for that, Franco. Um, I understand you have to leave very shortly. Um, Thank yeah. you for sharing that you're preparing for your upcoming wedding. So, um, but before you leave, there was one question from, from William from Taiwan. He's asking, what is the most difficult part of providing or generating clean energy? Um, can you share that and also maybe some parting thoughts for, for this session? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a very, um, you know, difficult uh, question to uh, to answer. Uh, I, I would say in developing countries, the most difficult uh, part of the of the of this business is getting financing, right? Um, so food waste and agro waste is everywhere, virtually everywhere here. 
and there are a lot of producers that are willing are willing to 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 in, incorporate their technologies and the technology is already available not here in Argentina or in Latin America but probably in other countries and can be imported so probably we would need uh, uh, some some early movers that w would would like to heavily invest in new technologies uh, here in, our, in in Latin America let's say um, and that uh, th those those investors will be the will have the the first mover advantage so I, I think this technology is already proven and deployed e elsewhere uh, it will be incorporated here it's a matter of time and one of the uh, major challenges here is uh, you know getting a uh, good technologist and good financing for the projects. And so I, I, I think that's what we're working on right now. Um, um, we have already the first projects uh, ongoing. We're trying to get some financings uh, up there from multilateral banks or for private in, from private investors. Um, this, is, this is hard work here in Argentina. The VC market is not very well developed here. So uh, it's, it's a challenge, but I, I think I mean, these these kind of technologies are are a fact, and that, that they, they will be deployed here uh, sooner or later. So we, we have to keep working on that. And um, uh, I'm I unfortunately have to have to take off, but I, I would I would like to share some some thought about these uh, Beyond Food Innovation uh, webinars and and the future bootcamp. I'm I'm really excited, and it's a, it's in a great uh, it has a great timing because we're tackling you know. Uh, discussions, global discussions that they are already ongoing. Uh, not only environmental impact of food production or healthcare, but uh, like major problems of humanity, which are climate change or poverty er eradication. Right. So we're tackling different challenges in different levels. So I, I really, uh, I'm, 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 I really thank you very much for for letting me participate in this in this webinar. I look forward for for the next ones and definitely. Looking forward for the next bootcamp, uh, for the Beyond Food Innovation Bootcamp. That would be so, very exciting. Uh, thank you very Andrew. much, Franco. Clearly very large problems. We wish you all the best. Um, and unfortunately, you have to leave early right now, but uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you uh, shortly. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So, Ben, back to you. Yes. So, your thoughts. Um, so let's shift uh, perspectives a little bit here. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, where you see, you know, we kind of got cut short uh, just because Franco had to leave. But uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the next uh, uh, big thing that you see in, you know, the food innovation journey, the food space. Uh, can you share a little bit more of your insights on that? Uh, you mean with Growing North in particular? Yes. Or okay. well, or, growing north, and also perhaps you know the global conversation on on why we need to start tackling this now. You know, alluding to the fact that uh, Franco just said specifically that um, this is a global challenge, um, mm -hmm. and and we need people, the the best, uh, highly motivated people from around the world to be uh, addressing them right now because it takes such a long time. There's such a long life cycle. You know, President mm -hmm. Rife here talked about the patient capital, that's just one component, right? But really, we need uh, global uh, leaders, global innovators to solve these challenges, and, and that's really key. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the really key things that uh, Franco mentioned before he left um, was, uh, was some statistics raised at the, at the Paris conference, and it was, he was saying that 25% uh, of the world's carbon emissions come from agriculture, and the other 25% come from, uh, he said, energy generation, I'm pretty sure. Um, another huge component of that is transportation as well. And when we're talking about food, when we're talking about, you know, the very sustenance that humans need to survive and that we need to continuously produce this, we're talking about 50 plus percent of, of, that, of that space because uh, food touches on energy generation. You have to have energy. Food touches on water um, and, and how much water is available. Um, and obviously it touches on, on the levels of, of food insecurity. I mean, there's a, I was just reading a report the other day. It's an older report, um, 2015, 2016, I think 785 million people don't have access to, to food 
today in this in this world. Hundreds of millions again don't have access to water. Hundreds of millions don't have access to 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 uh, just like affordable power. Um, and of course, we need to start addressing these. Of and I think one of the things that I guess young innovators in uh, I guess in my circles at least, what we've come to notice is that the way by which the world operates right now uh, and the way by which we interact with other countries on, on, a, on a, an economic level is extremely inefficient. Um, uh, for example, in Canada, in Toronto, we ship in 80% of the most commonly consumed types of, of produce. We ship it in to our country from an average of about 5,000 kilometers away. Um, And for me, I'm sitting here as as a Canadian entrepreneur, as somebody from the food space who's grown up on a farm, and I look around and I say, guys, what the heck are we doing? We have the second largest country in the world, geographically speaking. We have endless, endless fields to be able to grow uh, in the summertime. And we have endless access to, to... uh, access for to be able to build assets or food production assets we grow year round why are we outsourcing an economic opportunity to save three cents here three cents there and I think that what a lot of entrepreneurs in 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 the new entrepreneur space the new kind of innovator space I think what they're doing is they're starting to, to question why the world operates the way it does and how they can capitalize on being able to, to change things I mean, Franco was uh, was referring to the uh, to the circular economy quite a bit, and you know I'm a huge fan of that as well. I think that you know it makes a lot of sense to be more efficient, to to be able to reduce our footprint, to be able to to help more people and use less in doing so. I think that that any person with a brain would agree that that makes a lot more sense. Um, so, no, to answer your question, why are they so pressing? They're pressing because we can't move forward if if we can't sustain ourselves. Yeah. We cannot yeah. keep going if we can't sustain ourselves. And that's what it boils down to, plain and simple, in my opinion. Great. This is uh, definitely, definitely a um, very complex issue that requires significant, not only a significant amount of thought. Uh, a very well thought through plan in terms of collaboration as well as partnerships um, in order and, and I would also say not just partnerships in one particular vertical in the food but really across the entire spectrum mm-hmm. of the uh, beyond what we call the beyond food innovation journey and life cycle really because if you look at it you know traditionally a, a journey is a start has a start and so, and and and, but at the end, really, what we're trying to do here is to pull it around and say, "Hey, it's actually a life cycle. Hey, it's actually um, there are pieces that all fit together. There are new ways mm-hmm. to look at collaboration that everybody wins. There are new ways to to do this, and which is why the next boot camp in Taiwan is going to be focused thematically on the Beyond Food uh, journey." Mm-hmm. On the entire and, life cycle, absolutely. Yeah. So one, one, another, just another key point that I think is is also really important is is we're starting to change our definitions of of a lot of things, and one in particular that I am really excited about changing is the definition of waste. Um, and as we continuously move forward and we start to to have new green technologies and and new ways of thinking. Waste as a term is starting to be changed into resource. Absolutely. And it's how can we use this this byproduct, which is no longer waste, to do something else? Um, and how can we continuously reuse these different aspects of, of production to become something? And, uh, I mean, every country is at its own uh, length with it right now. They're, they're at its own life cycle with it right now. But everybody is starting to, to have this understanding that, you know, there is no such thing as, as waste waste anymore, and we can we can actually start to reuse, repurpose, um, and and integrate all of these different byproducts back into the life cycle, and that's really exciting. Awesome. Um, so let's move on to Rodrigo. 
Rodrigo, so, you know, you were part of the boot camp, as was Ben, as was Franco. Um, tell me more about your experience of the boot camp and what, what became of your, your journey after. Because it's only six days. It, the more important part is what happened after. It's been a year. Has it been a year? Almost. Yeah, it's almost a year, like six to eight months. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, the, the boot camp is, has been one of the biggest opportunities that I've ever had because, well, actually I heard about the bootcamp because I took both Entrepreneurship 101 and Entrepreneurship 102 at EDX. And actually I applied for class two, but I was not able to get the, the money. So I didn't attend that bootcamp, but I stepped back and applied next year for the class four. And actually I realized I, that probably I didn't try enough in class two, but this time I was so determined to, to get funding. And after a lot of struggle, I was able to to get funding for this for this bootcamp. And I realized that this bootcamp is not about theory, is not about concepts because they are already available for free for anyone. So it's more about to putting into practice what you have learned and to train and acquire uh, new skills. Because actually my goal at the bootcamp was to improve my leadership skills and how to become a better leader and to develop my personal skills. So by doing that, uh, I thought that by doing this, I, was, I, were, I will be able to create any successful new venture at any industry because I will train myself, not only in a particular a set of skills, but also develop my own personal skills. And this is a huge opportunity to do that. And this experience led me to eventually mentoring a MOOC course pro, uh, provided by MIT. So I'm just going to pause you there for a second. But so yeah. just because not everybody listening in or viewing actually understand what a, what's a MOOC. Um, so a MOOC is a massive open online course. Uh, just to make it clear to everybody, so we have, MIT has put a series of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation courses online, part of the larger group of courses that we have online in all the different um, disciplines that we teach here at MIT. We, we translate them into online courses for uh, the rest of the world to consume. In fact, our courses reach over 199 countries, uh, territories, locations in the world. So pretty much covers the entire world. <laughs> the the uh, the important part here, I think, uh, to just to uh, paraphrase what uh, Rodrigo has said, really is uh, you acquire the knowledge online, and then we uh, invite you to come to a uh, boot camp wherever that might be um, to practice that with um, a network of and a cohort of uh, global leaders and innovators and entrepreneurs that uh, you traditionally wouldn't get to meet. Um, in just one location. Typically, we would have uh, people from over 35 different countries uh, who attend our, our programs. So uh, back to you, Rodrigo. Can you share a little bit about, um, you know, you, you've been a, a PA uh, on the online course, but what for you in this entire process made it uh, life-changing for you? Well, actually... Uh because I was able to be confident enough to take the next step in every decision that I make and every plan that I'm, that I'm having because it, it, it's, it's, it's important to take into consideration that I was almost... Uh, the, this whole story about me being at the bootcamp, taking previously the online courses and then becoming a, a mentor in TA, community TA, uh, this could have never happened. And the, all of this happened because I, I make the decision to start doing it and to start pursuing that. So this is a call for everyone who is out there and who's probably thinking that they won't, even make, they won't even make it to the bootcamp because they actually can do it. And if they are trying hard enough, if they are using all of the resources that they have available, they actually have every single uh, resource that they can, if they use every single resource that they have, they actually 
will be able to be at the boot camp and even further and they can accomplish anything. So this experience provides me the confidence to actually tell myself that I can absolutely accomplish every single goal that I set. So the, this was a life-changing experience in that manner. So I will definitely recommend a, anyone that's watching this to start to start trying to apply for this bootcamp because they won't even they will never know if they are able to to be at the bootcamp if they don't even try. So this is all about trying, and every single time you need to try. Great, thank you for sharing. So Benjamin, you just came back from, you know, before your Arctic trip, you were in uh, Australia for the most recent bootcamp in, in, in March this year. Um, can you share a little bit about your experience at, at the most recent bootcamp that we had? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, kind of echoing everything that, that uh, Rodrigo was saying, I mean, it's, it is really important to put yourself out there and to try and to, I mean, the sheer numbers of the boot camp are, are quite frightening when you when you kind of boil it down, but there's so much more that you can get involved with as well with the MIT community, with the with the boot camp alum, with and, and just I mean they're great people by all means. Like they they are they're uh, always willing to help and, and and help you out. One of my biggest things that I took away from the boot camp um, was the concept of time um, and how many. I mean when you think of a day, people are like. Yeah, we work from, from 9 to 5. The day is 8 hours. No, a day is 24 hours long. And those are 24 long hours that you can work to accomplish things. Um, and if anybody else from the boot camp is, is listening right now from any boot camp, you're obviously kind of snickering and looking back at, at your experience, the, I don't know, day 4, day 3 at, at 6 a.m. and you realize you haven't slept in, in 3 or 4 days and you're like, Wow, I feel great, and <laughs> um, and being able to, to push yourself past the limit as to what you thought you were able to. I mean, MIT is always talking about drinking from a fire hose, um, and it's so true because you have no idea how much you can do until you take away your limits that you put on yourself, and then you just run with it. Um, so that was that was one of my biggest things that I took away was was just how long and how hard you can keep going. Uh, yeah, absolutely loved it. Would recommend everybody listening, please apply, learn about it. It's, it's a life-changing experience. It really is. Perfect. So we'll try to get into um, some questions here. Um, so I think Jaron Lorenzo has been asking quite a few questions about, you know, how can all these uh, challenges that we're facing, um, can we then um, look at ways to holistically improve quality of life for people across the spectrum. Do either of you have thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I do. I'll go first, Rodrigo, and then do you want to tag in? Yeah, so why, why don't Ben, you go first, and then Rodrigo can, yeah, sure. can, yeah. can continue. Well, I mean, so the question is how, if I'm understanding this right, how can, in today's society, how can we continuously have improvements in the quality of life of all people all over the world. Did I understand that yeah. correct, Andrew? Yeah. So in my opinion, I think that it boils down to being able to unlock the creative capacity of, of individuals all around the world. Humans are, are born creative. We're creative creatures. We build and we, we solve problems. And I think that what it, the way to be able to solve an, a large number of problems is to be able to, in my opinion, have entrepreneurial education and creative education taught to students at a, from a very young age so that they grow up and they see the world not as a place full of problems, not as a place uh, where you know we're killing the planet every single day, but as somebody who will grow up and will see the ocean full of plastic and go, you know what, we could make a solution for this and we can make... Uh, products out of this and we can make money off of this. I mean, the oldest known language in, in the world, in my opinion, is commerce and is how we can continuously uh, benefit each other moving forward. So I think that, and it is a little high in the sky. I mean, if you want to get down into the infrastructural how-tos, you do X, do Y, that's to come. But I think that's the philosophy of it, is being able to teach people from a very young age to see opportunities and not problems. So what if I understand what you're saying here really is about fundamentally shifting um, 
mindsets and the way we think and how that can, uh, sort of um, addresses cultural issues. And then um, what I found very fascinating was what you said about, you know, it's about changing the mindset. It's about really, you know, then it's not really about food anymore, is it? It's the, you know, abstracting from the spectrum of just what the first layer of the impact of food uh, we're, we're really looking deeper into uh, larger issues like quality of life, commerce. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Rodrigo, your, what, what about you? What, what are your thoughts on all these? Yeah, I think that for an entrepreneur to be able to address a global issue, they need to start looking for problems that they are having in their daily life and that people around them are having. Because if you start looking at problems wherever you are, you will then start realizing a key, key features that you need to take into consideration every time that you are trying to create a new venture. So my recommendation, my recommendation will be to start looking for problems that you already have right now and people around you have. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Um, we've come to the end of our hour for the second MIT boot camp, uh, boot Beyond Food webinar. Um, this, I hope this has been uh, a learning uh, time for you. It has been insightful. Um, also, thank you, Franco, who had to leave early. Uh, we wish you, again, all the best. Um, the, the webinars will continue. We will be featuring uh, new uh, guest speakers on our future webinars um, that will talk about the entire spectrum of the Beyond Food journey and even abstracting beyond that. And if you're interested to learn more, please visit us at uh, bootcamp.mit.edu uh, slash entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship slash beyond food. Um, and uh, we wish you a good uh, time. Thank you very much for listening in and for watching. Um, all the best. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye-bye.